Hey everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. Today, we are going to be bringing you some neurotech news. Specifically, we are going to be talking about the first use of high bandwidth wireless brain computer interface. But before we get into that, sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. Just a few weeks ago, scientists from Brown University, Stanford University, Case Western University, along with the Providence Veterans Affair Medical Center and the Massachusetts General Hospital, collaborated in order to create the first ever wireless high bandwidth brain computer interface. Now while all those words might be a little bit of mumbo jumbo for you, I'm here to help you out. I'm going to help you break down the jargon so that you can be in the know of the neurotech advancements that have been happening over these past few months. So what is a brain computer interface? A brain computer interface is a connection between the brain and a computer. And while that might seem simple, how do we do that and what purpose does it serve? A brain computer interface can serve as assistive technology. This enables people with various neurological disorders to manipulate a computer which can help improve their quality of life and their ability to function in the world. So a brain computer interface can allow somebody with paralysis or multiple sclerosis or some other disorder to control a computer which can allow them to communicate to others or perhaps even control a prosthetic limb. So the group of collaborators at Stanford, Brown, and Case Western University are known as BrainGate, and they created the first wireless brain computer interface. The significance of this is that the patient is no longer tethered to the computer, and so this can allow them to have more mobility and allow them to get back to more of a normal lifestyle. The brain gate brain computer interface was cabled and so this tethered the individual to the computer. How this works is there's a micro electrode array which is surgically implanted over the patient's brain then that is attached by a cable to an amplifier which then is attached by a fiber optic cable to the neural signal processor. The neural signal processor decodes the information from the patient's brain so that they can control the computer. Now, while this is great technology to have, the restrictive component is the fact that they are attached by a wire to a computer and that this isn't very mobile. So a lot of the times these computer systems are in the hospital and so the patient can only use the brain computer interface when they are in the hospital setting. The wireless brain computer interface is a lot more mobile. The size of the device is about 2 inches and it weighs about 1.5 ounces. You can see it in this image on top of one of the participants head. Now, the significance of this is that the device is attached to the computer wirelessly. So while we still have the microelectrode array, it is now attached to a BWD or a bandwidth pedestal mounted wireless transmitter. So this BWD has a wireless receiver which receives the signal from the patient's brain. That information goes to a digital hub and it is then delivered by a fiber optic cable to the same neural signal processor that I mentioned earlier. Again, the information is then decoded and it is used to control the computer system that the patient is using. So in the study that scientists at BrainGate did, they had two patients that were originally used in the wired um, brain computer interface, and this was a 35 year old patient along with a 63 year old patient. Around 200 electrodes were implanted on the patient's brains, and with the wireless transmitter we have about a 36 hour battery life, so the scientists were able to record data for 24 hours. And the benefit of them moving wirelessly 
at the time that they did was that it was around the beginning of the pandemic so this allowed the scientists to continue their research while the patients were able to stay safe in the comfort of their own home. This accessibility that was highlighted by the pandemic is something that will continue to benefit patients around the world should this technology become more of a prominent treatment option for patients dealing with these difficult neurological disorders. What the scientists wanted to answer was whether the wireless brain-computer interface was as efficient and as effective as the wired brain-computer interface. As they could see from the study, a lot of the data was comparable. So as you can see in this image which presents the wired data in light blue and the wireless data in dark blue, we can see that there was no significant difference between the results and the recordings in the wired situation and the wireless situation. So in terms of the percent correct, they both are comparable in terms of decoding the neural signals and in terms of the bit rate they both have a similar speed of processing. If we also look at the recordings from a single electrode in the brain computer interface we can see that they both have similar amplitudes and so the signal strength is just as strong in the wireless and the wired brain computer interface. So, in conclusion, brain gate may have found a way to move from this bulky wired brain computer interface to a more accessible wireless brain computer interface. My question to you is, what do you think this could mean for the future of neurotechnology and what implications do you think that this might have on society? If you have any ideas or any answers to those questions, feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you want to leave any other questions or comments down below, we'll try our best to get back to you. Make sure you subscribe so you can join us for weekly videos on NeuroPsyQ, and if you like this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up. That's all for today. I'll see you next time on NeuroPsyQ.